Hey, I'm Pat. Welcome to Bible U. Today we're going to talk about theodicy. Where was God when it happened? How can a just God stand by and let this happen? Now, I would be remiss if I did not admit that these are some of the most difficult questions humans have struggled with and that the greatest minds in history have wrestled with these questions. Historically, the argument has looked like this. If God cannot prevent bad things from happening, then God is not all powerful. And if God will not prevent evil, God is not all good. Now, for all of you theology nerds, there's a theological term for this dilemma. It's called theodicy. Now, there are no simple answers to this, but there are some answers that can and should lead us to hope in the midst of our pain. So allow me to give a, a brief four-part answer, but before I do, I want to show some empathy to some of you who may be in the midst of what some have called the dark night of the soul. If you're there, if you're in the middle of the dark night of the soul, if you're in the midst of intense pain and suffering, I get that you are in survival mode. You're just trying to make it through the, another day. I understand that. I've been there. And if I live long enough, I'll be there again someday. And so for you, I just want to pause for a moment and just pray for you. Jesus, Spirit of God, would you just show up in a powerful way right now? Would you just remind those who are in the dark night of the soul that you love them, that you know their pain, that you feel their pain? Would they know that in a special way right now? Amen. I suggest that you and I take these four things I'm going to share and hang on to these for the next time, and there will be a next time that we wrestle with this question, where was God when this happened? Number one, we have to begin by asking what it means for God to be God. In other words, we must admit that our finite, temporal, limited minds cannot and will not ever fully understand what it means for God to be God. You see, when the Bible says that God is eternal, it means that for him, the past, present, and future all exist at the same time. So he's never waiting to see how things turn out. <sighs> when the Bible says that God is omnipresent, it does not mean that he is so big that he spreads himself out throughout the universe, but it means that all of God is everywhere all of the time. <sighs> When the Bible says that God is holy, just, righteous, loving, merciful, gracious, good, kind, and the list could go on and on, it's not saying that sometimes he's holy and sometimes he's just and sometimes he's loving and sometimes he's merciful. No, God is all of these attributes at the same time, all of the time. Now, your brain is probably ready to explode, as it should, because as I said, our finite temporal limited minds cannot fully fathom his eternality, his omnipresence, and his absolute consistent non-changing character. So the first thing we must understand as we wrestle with difficult questions such as, where was God when this happened? Or how can a just God stand by and let this happen? Is to let God be God and not pull him down to our limited finite level. Unlike us, he sees all things, he knows all things, he understands all things, and is the only being in the universe that is completely and consistently all good, all holy, all loving, all merciful, all righteous. He is all of these things all of the time. And by the way, this bigger than we can imagine God is passionately in love with your soul. Number two, Notice that we seldom ask this question when things are going well. I never hear us wrestle with this legitimate concern, where was God when this happened, when the rain is falling on a parched land, or when the earth rotates perfectly to allow another sunrise and sunset, or when the environment produces the perfect amount of oxygen allowing humans and animals to continue to inhale life-giving breath, or when our weather patterns cycle sunshine, rain, dew, and snow to bring necessary seasons or when our heart beats every second to bring life-giving blood to our body, or when, fill in the blank. Because the list could go on and on and on. My point is that the question, where was God 
when this thing happened is a legitimate question, but as we answer it, let's not forget that we need to be consistent and ask the same question for the abundance of blessings and good things that befall us every second of every day. Number three, God hates sin. He has given humans an amount of freedom and he empathizes with our pain. The beginning of this narrative displays a loving, yes, God, who created humans in his image and gave them freedom to choose. I call him a yes, God, because in the beginning he said yes to everything and no to one thing. In fact, he tells the original humans to not do the one thing he said not to do because it will hurt them. But they did it. And ever since that fatal decision, humans have been making choices that hurt themselves and others. In other words, evil exists. I recall right after 9-11 hearing the questions, how could God do that? How could God have two planes fly into those towers? He didn't. Evil men with hatred and murder in their hearts flew those planes into those buildings. You see, we as humans have this problem I might call collective ownership. We refuse to own the evil that happens because of us. Remember, God said, don't do this. God hates sin, but he has given humans an amount of freedom. And because of that, evil exists. Not because God desires it, but because humans have chosen to ignore God's direction. God is not the source of evil. Oh, and we must add to this that not only is God not the source of evil, but our God empathizes with our pain. He sees it. He has experienced it, and he weeps with us. Listen to what Susan Pitchford wrote in her book titled God in the Dark, a book about suffering. Most days I can accept that God is crazy enough and crazy enough about us to think that this whole experiment is worth the trouble, but accepting it doesn't mean I understand. I can dig around in the problem of evil, but when I dig deep enough to encounter God, I run into Mystery. When that happens, I lay down my shovel and fall on my face at his feet. Oh, listen to this part. And when I see that those feet are wounded, I'm reminded that however little I understand about God's response to evil and suffering, I know for sure that he does not observe it from a safe distance. He has cared enough to enter into it completely and bear the full weight of it in his own body and soul. Wow, God sees your pain, has experienced pain, and weeps with us in our pain. Number four, the full weight of the answer to this difficult question, where was God when this happened, is found in the future. Oh, my friend, hang on to this one. It is one reason God included the last book of the Bible. You see, when we look at the future, asking this legitimate question, why doesn't God step in and do something? We see that God goes way beyond just stepping in. In fact, someday, God will end all injustices forever. Listen to these words in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. Someday, someday God will not just step in, but he will make all things new and completely eradicate all evil for how long? Forever. Next time you're in a, a dark night of the soul, hang on to these truths. But most of all, grab onto the feet of Jesus and notice his wounds because those wounds remind you that he sees your pain, he knows your pain, he loves you intensely. And one day, he will completely eradicate pain and suffering forever.